Historically, Americans have been called to be the keepers of the flame of liberty. And that liberty depends on innovative thinkers, the free exchange of ideas, and people with a can-do spirit. Elizabeth Clare Prophet, noted author, lecturer, educator, and religious leader, interviews revolutionaries in every field who provide the missing dimension to the news that affects you. The forum you are about to see was filmed before thousands assembled at the Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana. Here, in a secluded valley in the heart of the Northern Rockies, concerned citizens of the world gather each summer to attend an international conference for spiritual freedom. They commune with life, meet old friends and new, and hear the flame of freedom that speaks through Elizabeth Clare Prophet and her guests at Summit University Forum. This week, Elizabeth Clare Prophet leads a roundtable discussion on the crisis in South Africa with Usville June, political counselor for the Embassy of South Africa. James Kendricks, former consultant to the governments of Nigeria and Liberia. Reverend Kenneth Frazier, veteran civil rights activist. And Reverend E. Jean Vossler, defense activist. Their topic, South Africa at the crossroads. The direction of social and political change in light of sanctions, disinvestment, the superpower rivalry, the ANC, and the press. Welcome to Summit University Forum, where the flame of freedom speaks. I'm Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Tonight our guests are here to talk about the Republic of South Africa. With international attention focused on South Africa, on apartheid, we want to get the questions answered. We want to know why all of this attention. What is going on? Is the struggle between black and white, black and black, or is there more to it on the international scene? Is this the superpowers? And is South Africa going to become a football between them? Tonight, my guests are Us Viljun, political counselor for the Embassy of South Africa in Washington, D.C. James W. Kendricks, formerly a consultant to the governments of Nigeria and Liberia, and an expert on South African affairs. Reverend Kenneth Frazier, a veteran civil rights activist who recently returned from a two-week fact-finding tour of South Africa. Reverend Jean Vossler, a defense activist who has lectured internationally on defense issues, has kept tabs on political developments in South Africa since he went on a three-week lecture tour there in 1981. Gentlemen, welcome to Summit University Forum. Let's get right on the subject that concerns Americans most. That is apartheid. What is it? Is it being dismantled or is it going to continue? Would you like to begin? Well, of course, we see apartheid in different terms. Uh, we, don't, we don't see apartheid as a system uh, which was designed to deny people their legitimate rights. We saw in the beginning apartheid as a system which was designed exactly to assure to every group of people uh, the measure of self-determination that they would need to maintain their own identity and their own freedom within the bigger South Africa. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as, as we know, the whole question has developed in a way that no one really wanted and that, that we couldn't uh, in the end approve of. And so the government of South Africa two, three years ago formally announced that those aspects of apartheid uh, 
uh, that would deny people their rights, that would deny people equal opportunities, were wrong and were to be corrected urgently. Uh, this does not mean that with dismantling apartheid we have moved to uh, a situation where we would want to see uh, one man, one vote in, 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 in an unitary state in the sense that there wouldn't be any minority groups protected from domination by stronger groups. So it all depends really on what one sees as apartheid. If one sees it as wrongful denial of rights to people, that is wrong and that we reject. If, we see, if, if one sees it as guaranteeing to people the right to be themselves, that we do not reject and that we shall continue to, to pursue. Do I understand from what you are saying then that Concerning the vote, uh, if you have a one man, one vote, uh, this puts the whites in the minority. And is this what is concerning you? No, no, I don't think we, we're concerned about that at all. I think South Africa is a country of minorities. The whites is one of them, certainly. But there are many black nations in South Africa who are as fearful of domination as, as anyone. There's a group of Asians in South Africa, less than a million of them, uh, mainly of Indian extraction, who, who are quite concerned that should, should a one-man, one-vote system be instituted, they would end up being treated like Indian communities elsewhere in Africa have been treated uh, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years. Mr. Kendricks, uh, you're an American, and you know that we may have many minorities in this country, and yet we do not fear the vote. Uh, we have found that whites elect blacks, uh, Christians elect Jews, Jews elect Catholics. What's your view of apartheid in South Africa? I think apartheid in South Africa, as we in America understand it, uh, which would be simply to equate it with what we've known in America as uh, segregation in, in the southern states and later in the northern states, uh, the South Africans would reject that and would say unequivocally that apartheid must go. On the other hand, if one understood uh, or to understand what they were attempting to do in terms of separate development, one can appreciate where they started. Perhaps they have gotten that over time they got off on the wrong track uh, and proceeded down separate tunnels. But at this point in their, de their development, they are now in the same tunnel. And being in that tunnel, apartheid is no longer uh, a reasonable mechanism or social condition. So I think that we would all agree that apartheid must go. Now you having been a part of South Africa and con a consultant to its government, what has been your experience there? Uh, how does this affect you and uh, how do you feel they're making progress in the dismantling of apartheid? Well, I can cite examples. Uh, it's really interesting before I cite the examples. Um, in the West, no matter what example is, is, is cited as evidence of the South Africans and the government's intent to remove apartheid, it's not believed. But they have, for example, trade unions, black trade unions. They have total trade unions. Um, if I were to, to enumerate all of the elements of apartheid that have been chipped away, uh, there would only be two elements that would be left. And, I, and, and they would be education and the mixed marriages. I'm sorry, uh, and the Group Areas Act. But mixed marriages have been done away with. Uh, they do vote, blacks vote, whites vote. Uh, 
there are, all of the dispensations are gone. Uh, and even now, the Group Areas Acts aren't being uh, enforced to any strong degree. People are living outside of the areas. And that, too, is on the way out. And, and we anticipate that that will be gone in the very near future. And the difficult area, of course, will be education. And the reason for education is because the law, in response to education, people says, basically, that one, people will be taught in their basic tongue. So that means that uh, if people choose to have their youngsters taught in Zulu, or in English, or uh, in Afrikaans, then they have that right to how their youngsters are taught and in what language they're taught in. So that becomes a far more difficult question. Why is that difficult? Because then you remove people's freedom to determine how they choose to have their youngsters educated. It is the same issue that we dealt with here in America when busing became a major issue. People didn't want their youngsters bused. I didn't want my youngster bused out of our neighborhood uh, to sit next to a white child in a white school in a white community. My feeling on that was that it eroded my freedom to determine where my child would go to school. I think that same issue responds to the South Africans. They have a right to determine what language they would prefer their youngsters be taught in. And at least at this point in their development, it may change in the future. But at this point in the development and, and in terms of freedom, we can't allow the government to usurp all of our freedoms. And I think that's one of the major issues here. So you think the freedom to choose what language a child should be educated in is good to have as the individual choice of parents? Well, I think it responds to the culture of the youngster. Um, I think uh, culture is important and language as a part of one's culture is important. One's history is important. Um, I would hate to have uh, in America it imposed upon me that I tomorrow would have to speak Spanish. I happen to prefer to speak English. I have been brought up in an English speaking home. For the government tomorrow in California to say to me, James, you and your family now must speak Spanish, and your children must attend an institution where only Spanish will be taught, would be a major impediment to the growth and development of my children. Are you saying the government is already guaranteeing this freedom of language or has not yet done so? At this point in time, it is my understanding that children are taught in their native tongue. Uh, if the English-speaking youngsters go to English-speaking schools. Uh, the Afrikaans youngsters go to Afrikaans-speaking schools as well as English-speaking schools. Uh, Zulu youngsters attend schools where Zulu is spoken as the medium of expression in terms is of information. Is there a national language in South Africa? I think there are basically two national languages, English and Afrikaans, but that's not enforced as well. I mean, you don't stop the Indians from speaking their native tongue. You don't stop the, the various ethnic groups from speaking their tongue. What I'm really saying is that if you said to the Zulus tomorrow that you have to speak Afrikaans, I don't think it would go over very well. Well, do you anticipate that anyone would do this? you have well, concerns about this? We, we, were, we were not discussing the issue of language as much as we were discussing the issue of what happens to the educational system. That's right. And I think far, a far more important aspect of the educational system is to upgrade the educational system. Whether the language spoken is Afrikaans, English, or Zulu. The major issue is going to be additional schools, additional classrooms, upgrading teachers and so forth, and perhaps in an integrated setting. And I think that's where they want to move to. Uh, the engine of any growing and developing country depends on its educational system. That's right. And that is one of the major issues that South Africa is dealing with currently. Uh, they have put more money in the budget uh, for education than they have for defense, which is an indication 
that they recognize the need for an upgraded educational system. Nevertheless, they still have not, as we understand it in the West, integrated their school systems. And what we tend to mean by that is that I sat next to Ace and to Gene. And because I sat next to them, by some magic, I'm going to receive the benefit of a better education. Um, you know, I'm just not prepared to buy that. Um, You know, language does complicate the issue of equal education in as much as you must have teachers fluent in the language desired by the people. And uh, then if you also want to integrate them, uh, it would seem to me that the upward mobility of the blacks of South Africa would be secured by allowing them to have their native tongue plus the national language so that they were adept in English or Afrikaans and able to move into government positions, business positions, and so forth. Uh, I think that uh, the desire to preserve the culture on the part of the tribes themselves as well as to integrate uh, should be a challenge uh, to uh, have the best of both worlds uh, in terms of language, culture, and faculty for these children. I'm, I'm wondering, Mr. Viljun, exactly uh, how your government sees this challenge of education, which is, could be the great unifying uh, factor of the nation to defeat the forces of of international uh, opposition to the nation at this time? Well, uh, I have to start but where James left off, I think, just by reiterating that for a, for a child to start its school education in the first grade, uh, learning through a language which is, has never been spoken in its home is an extremely difficult thing. So we try as far as possible to accommodate people. That is the policy anyway. Uh, to therefore accept children in the primary grades speaking almost exclusively their own language but teaching them one of the two mainly English as national language progressively more and more so that in the senior grades of high school or which we call high school which you know is pre-university training. Uh, I think you'd refer to it as college. Uh, they would almost rece uh, receive almost all of their education then through the medium of English. To prepare them for tertiary education uh, which, which is not offered in, uh, in their tribal languages for various technical reasons, you know. Uh, no one has got really so far as rewriting maths in Zulu or, or in Sutu or that sort of thing. So uh, for, for higher education it is absolutely essential that they know the languages in which those subjects can be taught. And uh, their school education is designed to prepare them for that. In order exactly to have at that level equality of opportunity. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. It does very well. And I think that education itself, in its, in its high quality, is absolutely essential to all people of South Africa. Uh, we ourselves have a Montessori school, uh, which we started in 1970. And uh, we made it bilingual for children age two and up. And we found, of course, that children develop language skills between the age of when they're born uh, through age seven. And that is when there is a, a certain ceiling of their fluency. And uh, I'd simply like to suggest that uh, it's in the nursery schools, in the preschool classrooms, that the bilingual uh, could be had and uh, could be very effective with bilingual teachers so that there is not such a burden on children at seven coming into an English or Afrikaans uh, classroom. And I think it makes for good friendships also when they form so early. That is true. Uh, if, if, if we were able to establish preschool uh, schooling, you know, nursery schools or uh, kindergarten type schools for children throughout the country, I'm sure, you know, no one would object to that. It, it would be marvelous. However, 
we have only just reached the point where we could institute obligatory education for everyone from age six. Uh, you know, so I think we're working on that, and certainly in the in the in the big metro metropolitan areas, uh, there are already a large number of uh, nursery schools of various descriptions in operation. Uh, but certainly we haven't got to the point yet where that sort of facility is available to everyone throughout the country and uh, where, we, where the government could use that as a policy tool. Sometimes these things are best done by the private sector. Uh, people, right. people doing things with people together. Mm. They are at the moment, you know, it's mainly churches, there are a few voluntary women's organizations that are very active in this field. Yes, we, we, we believe that too. But, if I may. <laughs> the problem isn't that we don't have a sufficient number of youngsters to educate. We've got millions of them. The problem, or one of the problems, is qualified teachers. Which goes adequacy, back to yes, adequacy education. of textbooks and materials, um, space, schools. The whole structure is now in the process of change. And, and that's where the emphasis is going to have to be made. And I think that's uh, more important at this point to, to, to have the classroom space to have adequate teachers, uh, to begin to use new technologies, uh, interactive video, uh, to bring in computers. I mean, none of that's available now. The sad problem of that is, is that if, you, if we look at the sanctions, it's not likely to go in. So The sanctions themselves are, are injuring the South African people. That's the point. And the, who are they injuring most? The blacks. That's the second point. So, and who do we want to educate? The blacks. How many? I mean, what we're really trying to do is, is, to, is for people to understand that the injuries being caused is to the very people that we choose to help. Those we wish to bring into the 21st century are the people we hurt by imposing sanctions. So it's, it's really important to understand the ebb and flow of what occurs in a political system and an economic system. So there's not sufficient economics. I mean, that country is not one of the mainstream major capitalist countries. I mean, its size economically is basically the same size as Yugoslavia. And we don't see that country as being uh, a country with ambience of economic growth and development. So what I'm saying is that by, by slowing down the investment engine, we injure the educational system. And that's the only parallel. That means we don't have the, the training and the technology. We don't have the equipment. We don't build sufficient schools. And we don't get Gene and I sitting next to each other. Uh, not that it's going to matter a lot, but at least you're correct. It does build friendships. It does have a cross-cultural sharing. It does allow me to know Gene's values. It does allow me to appreciate his humanity. And I think that's important because in the past it has not happened in that setting in South Africa. It has happened from a different perspective. For example, it has happened through uh, through labor, servants, work, uh, where blacks have worked in the homes of whites. I mean, they are not strangers to one another, but their youngsters have not gotten to know each other. And I think that's important. And I think you're correct. Um, I don't want to continue. <laughs> Reverend Frazier, tell me why Ted Kennedy and Jesse Jackson and Universities of America and international corporations are ignoring this very point of disinvestment and sanctions that the people who suffer most are those they are professing to help? 
I think, I think perhaps the, the major reason is that uh, those who uh, say they advocate a, a policy of uh, disinvestment in the interest of black South Africa really do not have uh, the blacks' interest at heart. Um, the, the news media uh, portrays uh, a perspective that the major problem in South Africa has to do only with the black-white struggle. You have on the one hand uh, a group of blacks who uh, want a democratic form of government. You have on the other hand a white racist government. And the issue clearly is the surrender of power on the part of the white establishment to, uh, to the blacks and then they're going to live happily ever after. Of course that isn't true. Uh, Jesse Jackson has said very little about South Africa. Uh, I think he's now running for the presidency. And if he were to take the position that uh, Randall Robinson, for example, takes, who is the executive director of Trans Africa, who um, makes no qualms about the fact that revolution is the only solution to the problem, of, the problem of apartheid, Jackson then could not be a viable candidate for the presidency. And so now he's traveling the country, talking to farmers, and very different campaign than that he waged four years ago. He's trying to appear now as a mainstream political candidate. South Africa is, in my estimation, political football. The issue there, while apartheid is a problem that needs to be corrected, I believe that uh, the primary interest in South Africa has very little to do with the issue of color. I believe that um, South Africa is a pawn uh, on the chess, international chessboard and that there are those who are adamant in their view that South Africa should not remain a free and independent state for any of its people but should be either under the clutches of the Soviet Union or at the disposal of the internationalists and the power elite. The fact that South Africa has had a problem and has a problem uh, around the issue of color uh, makes color a very uh, ideal uh, way to move in to divide that, uh, that economy and that, that people uh, and to exploit them for political ends. Uh, while I was there, I talked with uh, many, many blacks in the supermarkets. And first place, if you go into Johannesburg at night, as I did, you don't see anything, you go right to your hotel. You get up in the morning and you come out at 10 o'clock and you would hardly know that you were not in some downtown American city, Raleigh, North Carolina or Charlotte or, or uh, Philadelphia or someplace like that. You go in there with the anticipation that blacks are all going to be huddled in a corner, uh, not allowed to speak, uh, and of course that isn't so. I think Jim said something very, very uh, interesting and important. When I came back here, I talked with college professors, uh, I spoke with groups and churches and uh, uh, local people, and when I told them about what I actually saw there, they either thought I had been hallucinating or they quickly wanted to know who financed my trip. <laughs> They said, in effect, you were in South Africa and they didn't follow you around. You had access to, to people to talk to them. They don't believe that a black can go into South Africa uh, and have a, a dialogue with people uh, without being shuffled around by the police or otherwise indisposed, which isn't true. I found that there were blacks in the stores uh, serving behind cash registers, just as we have in in uh, downtown Washington or Los Angeles or wherever. Uh, when they found out that I was an American, they were very curious. They have a very uh, a fascination for America. I find that most people have a, a peculiar fascination for this country. They believe in America and in Americans.
What they cannot understand, however, is what's happened to America. They wanted to know, for example, why are we supporting communism in South Africa? Now, t tell us why they ask you that. What do they see as communism in South Africa? Uh, the South Africans that I had uh, some exposure to, and these were uh, not sophisticated people by any means. These were, these were people who worked in the streets and uh, on, in the stores and on the streets. They are well aware of what liberation communist style has brought to other parts of black Africa. They know, for example, that thousands of people, thousands of blacks in Ethiopia were systematically exterminated by the Marxist regime there after it came to power. And of course, it also came to power as a liberation movement. They know what's happened to those people. They also are aware of what's happening in Zimbabwe and Mozambique. And so you have people coming in there uh, from these uh, uh, bordering countries who are bringing with them the, the terrible stories about what is actually taking place as a result of the transfer of power to Marxist regimes in other parts of Africa. And although they know they have problems in South Africa, they know they are much better off now than they would be under a Marxist regime. And so they say, we don't want apartheid, but we don't want the ANC either. Reverend Vossler, what has been your experience in South Africa on this very point? I think basically the South African people want the right to control their own destiny. I think there is a real feeling and a desire for freedoms, as we know, on the part of those who do know what freedom's all about. I think um, it's very definitely true that uh, the black South African, to a great extent, is a pawn and being manipulated. And I think that they're more concerned about bread and butter issues and about their paycheck than maybe that we might think concerning freedom. Who do you believe is manipulating them? Well, I think it's obvious that the African National Congress is manipulating the people of the townships. Moderate blacks who are elected to town councils are being liquidated. It's black against black. The African National Congress uh, has 30 members in the executive committee of 19 of which are communist. And um, one of the chief executive officers of the African National Congress is Joe Slovo, who is a white a colonel in the KGB. And Oliver Tambo, who actually heads up the African National Congress, uh, who has been feeded recently by George Shultz, and African National Congress has been given political legitimacy by the American government. The same Oliver Tambo has visited Margaret Thatcher. And so we see the, the actual the plan of the West to legitimize the African National Congress, which is busily manipulating the people where individuals are taken to training camps in Libya and other places and taught in terrorist tactics, and where they are relying on soft targets such as bombing and terrorism and necklacing, which is simply placing rubber tires around enemies and dousing them with petrol and then setting fire to them and torching them alive. So when you have this kind of terrorist activity into part of anyone who is a part of the establishment, you have most of the police force is black, are black officers. And so these are targets. And so the, the real aim and goal, the real problem in a geographical context is the struggle for power in South Africa. And the struggle is essentially a revolutionary takeover drive on the part of the African National Congress, which is essentially a front group, essentially a front group for the South African, uh, South African Communist Party. And it's aided and abetted by the South African Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches and by individuals such as Desmond Tutu 
and Alan Bosek, who heads up the United Democratic Front. And so you have a coalition of the liberal universities and the churches and their liberation theology cooperating with the African National Congress and in primarily its revolution. The goal is takeover. And that's the real issue. It's not apartheid. Apartheid is used as an instrument to pit black against black, black against white, to divide and conquer. The, the idea of, of revolution has been taught. Tambo and, and his um, stooges, who are part of that African National Congress, make regular trips to Moscow. Tell us then, why is Schultz, corporations in America, the banks, those who are pulling out, why do they refuse to see that the ANC is a Marxist insurgency? Well, the State Department with George Schultz have has traditionally been friends of every Marxist government that's ever been developed in terms of uh, liberation theology and in terms of revolution. I mean, look, we backed uh, Fidel Castro and uh, you know, tossed out uh, Baptista. We backed the Sandinistas, you know, and against uh, Somoza. And we backed uh, um, Mugabe against Ian Smith. I, the State Department has never yet found a Marxist revolution they didn't like. This is a reality. The other, the other part of the story is that uh, corporations do like to do business with uh, communist states. Angola, case in point. Angola, of course, with Gulf Oil and Chevron, which we know is actually paying the Cuban mercenaries that keeps that tottering Marxist dictatorship in power. When you have Jonas Savimbi, who has basically the hearts and minds of his countrymen behind him, attempting to fight off uh, 35, 40,000 Cuban troops, and the Soviets have sunk in over $2 billion in arms and equipment into Angola. And you have all the front line states which are presently encircling South Africa, whether it be Mozambique. Mozambique has received $118 million from our government. You know, Mugabe, a communist state, has received $375 million from our government since 1981. Well, let's ask Mr. Viljoon, the presence of South Africa in these neighboring nations, Namibia, Mozambique, Angola, your presence is there. Tell me about it. I'm not sure I know what you... Uh, in, in Namibia, yes. Uh, South Africa administers that territory uh, according to our vision of things in terms of a, a mandate given by the League of Nations after the First World War. And we determined to remain there and to protect the, those people against the insurgency by a similar group called SWAPO, Southwest Africa People's Organization, operating out of Angola and trying to also stage a Marxist takeover in, 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 in Namibia. Uh, the position of, of the South African government is that the people of Namibia should be given the opportunity to choose their own leaders, to choose their own constitution, to choose their own government free from intimidation uh, and free from military threat. <coughs> uh, now we have the situation that, of course, as you know, there are 30 odd thousand Cuban troops in Angola supporting not only the Angolan government but also SWAPO's uh, military actions across the border into Namibia and uh, we want and the Americans are supporting us on that on, on that point at least or rather we're supporting them because the the original suggestion came from the uh, the, the US government uh, we would like those Cuban troops removed so that they don't pose as a as a threat against Namibia at the time when all these crucial decisions have to be made, when people have to decide about their constitution and, the, and elect their leaders. So we would like them withdrawn. We would like every legitimate political party, and by legitimate political party we mean political parties, political organizations that do not espouse violence to attain their, their aims. We would like them to, to participate in the political process 
and a great number of them are already participating. In fact, SWAPO is the only one who has refused to on the basis that it prefers to, to conduct a military action. That's as far as Namibia is concerned. Uh, unfortunately, independence has not been attained by that territory yet. It is our desire to, uh, to do everything in our power to facilitate independence for Namibia but not when the conditions are such that those poor people hardly have any choice where they're intimidated to vote for the candidates put up by SWAPO, to put it bluntly. You have tens of thousands of refugees from these neighboring states where communism has come in and uh, it's, it's always a wonder to me how people can think that South Africa mistreats its blacks when uh, so many come there, are supported, are given medical care, uh, are truly taken care of, uh, and even given jobs. And these jobs, of course, having been provided in some cases by the international corporations now pulling out. Uh, South Africa has been host then to these refugees. What is your position on that? That's a very difficult problem because obviously uh, from a humanitarian point of view, we would like to help them and we do all we can for them. Uh, the other problem is, of course, that they put other South Africans out of work because having lived uh, primarily in Mozambique, the largest number of refugees are from Mozambique, uh, under conditions of abject poverty, they prepared to come into the labor market and against the rules of the local unions, hire themselves out for half of the wages that, that, that South Africans, you know, regard as the minimum. Uh, and that is happening above all in the, in the agricultural sector. So, it is a problem. We have to protect our own citizens. We have to protect their employment. Uh, so, we've approached the United Nations Commissioner for Refugees and we have approached the International Committee of the Red Cross to assist us with this big problem, with this problem of providing for people who have nothing uh, and yet preventing the situation from, uh, you know, robbing South Africans of what they have been working for. The United Nations Commissioner for Refugees has refused to recognize these people as refugees. Uh, on what basis, I, I don't know, uh, but they have refused help. The Red Cross does help, but of course they, they don't have the resources to, uh, to make a, a large difference. So it has unfortunately also happened that we've had to send some of these people back to Mozambique, uh, you know, because we could accommodate so many and not more. And since the international community has refused to recognize them as refugees, uh, you know, there is, there, there is not much more that, 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 that we can do about the situation. It's a tragic thing. Isn't it true that there are electric fences on the borders and, and many of them don't even make it across? It is, true. it is true that on the Mozambican side there's a minefield before they reach the border. Uh, it is also true that a part of our own border, only a part, has been electrified uh, to, prevent, to prevent people really running down the fences day after day after day. And as you might know, that part of the border is also uh, a wild park, uh, you know, Kruger National Park in South Africa. And there are a large number of wild animals who do pose a threat and we would really prefer them not to come through there if they have to come through. But of course they're not allowed to come through border posts. So, so it is a real problem. So you, you have the communists who are sowing the mines to prevent their own people, from the Mozambicans, from escaping. Yes. Like a Berlin Wall, preventing them to get into the freedom of South Africa. What I can't understand, Mr. Kendricks, is there are many Americans who have gone on fact-finding missions and they can see the stark difference between Namibia, Angola, and Mozambique, if they care to look, and South Africa. Why would the Americans be 
moving South Africa towards a situation of greater and greater vulnerability economically by this disinvestment to the position where uh, the threat of communism could become real when we can see, we've watched for the 25 years that have gone by, what has happened to African states where communism has come in. Well, what do you think about these Americans who refuse to open their eyes to this? That's a very difficult question. An easy answer would be to suggest that perhaps America is more racist than is South Africa. Um, for Americans to propose to wish or propose to help the blacks in South Africa by taking away the economic growth and the potential uh, to negotiate um, government dispensations and economic potential for growth in that country uh, is, a, is a shame. The reason it's a shame is because uh, sanctions removes the capital that fuels the engine for growth, for economic growth. And without economic growth, political dispensations will mean very little. So without saying that that is the reason, I could as easily have said that perhaps they didn't know any better because they have not gotten the facts from the media. But, but we don't accept that, do we? Well, I mean, they, you can that, know better when you have a presence in South Africa as industry. You do know better. Well, industry perhaps would argue that they don't control the voice of the media. Of course, we understand that some of that may be true, but some of it may be false, uh, simply based on the fact that they do control what they support in terms of advertisements or in terms of programming through their advertisements. But again, I do think by far Americans are confused. Uh, Americans in general. In general are confused. I don't believe that there are enough South Africans of white, Asian, colored, black, Zulu, whatever, who come to the West and who say to us, stop wrecking South Africa. And that will allow those people themselves to develop both economically and politically those, those kinds of institutions that best work for them. Uh, and that's perhaps the best answer I can give you. South Africa today is tremendously burdened. It has been a rich and wealthy nation with a healthy economy. Now that rug is pull, being pulled out from under it by the withdrawal of these major firms. It is in our hearts a tragedy of immense proportions that a nation on the verge of proving a victory that perhaps no other nation on the African continent has actually proven the integration and the coming together of these peoples. On the verge of this victory, it is having the pressure, really, of superpowers. Communism on one hand, the United States and the West on the other. I'd like to get to the bottom of some questions then that are troubling university students who are demanding that their universities pull out. As you know, this went on in California. Tell me then about the homelands. This, this uh, particular question is brought up uh, is this just a way uh, to get the blacks out of the way, uh, to have them in their homelands and giving them voting rights? And tell us about the 13 separate tribes and uh, how you see them in, the, in that situation. Well, no, not at all. The homelands were not created as, as uh, concentration camps or whatever you, you would like to term them. Uh, to push people into from, from other areas where they might have lived. The homelands was the tribal land of the people where they 
where they have lived for generations and generations and all we've done was simply to give them the land to arrange their own affairs on a local level initially later on a, on a you know more more autonomy was given to them but the idea was that these people who were really and still are not Westerners you know they, they are Africans we as white people have a Western heritage and we have a Western political system and we have uh, a system of, of, of choosing our representatives according to you know democratic principles which 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 Americans all know traditionally in Africa it didn't happen that way uh, we couldn't come come in and impose a political system on people who who were not interested in living in any other way from you know in, in adapting why why should they have so what we've done is we've given them the autonomy they needed and we have taken the government over very many years has made a major effort to take industry out of the major centers to them to provide job opportunities to develop those areas and in some cases it has proved a marvelous success in other cases less so unfortunately but there are also economic factors to that however uh, these people continue to live in the homelands many are coming to the cities today they have complete freedom of movement everyone has they can choose to live where they want to and they can live there with the exception of of certain areas which have been provided for under the group areas act set aside for other ethnic groups however in the main a black person can live in the homeland or he can come to Johannesburg or he can go to Cape Town and he can find a job you know he can live where he can find a job or he can live simply where he wants to and create his own business uh, there's there's no problems about that but the, the the reality of the of you know people don't simply leave their their native territory uh, in Africa there's a very strong tradition about uh, about graves that are honored you don't leave the, the land where your parents and your grandparents were buried uh, so very many people still believe in that and it is for them a serious matter and it is for us to honor them and to respect their traditions and their way of life at the same time uh, you know giving giving them obviously all the opportunities that they that they want and and, and all the opportunities that they need uh, as a matter of fact it's it's it is today not even a question anymore of you know of, of debating the sort of question it is it is so much part of the way of life uh, that um, we, we are constantly surprised to come up against these this ridiculous sort of argument in the West that we've created labor reservoirs where to which we banish people and then if and when we need them we draw them in for a period of time uh, to use their labor and then summarily send them back that is you know it's utter nonsense so there's no restricted movement in South Africa for anyone no within South Africa no everyone can live where he wants to no, he... no one is confined to a certain black area from which he cannot emerge no absolutely not what what is true is as if as, as I've said uh, black people cannot live in areas uh, set aside for Indians or for whites as whites cannot live in Indian suburbs and so on but that is purely uh, you know with with inner city certain neighborhoods are set aside for uh, for, for certain groups but if a black wants to live in Johannesburg he can live in one of the areas of Johannesburg where you know where that is permitted and he can work in any take on any job in Johannesburg that he can find there is no limitation on the sort of work a black man can do there's no limitation on where he may do it there's no limitation on 
you know, what part of the country he, he has to live in or he, you know. Uh, Is there any limitation on what school, secondary, or higher education he can attend? Uh, yes, as, uh, as Jim pointed out, schools are in South Africa segregated. Uh, Where would Asians fit in with this then? They have their own school system. Are they allowed or not allowed to attend white schools or black schools? In cases, uh, the, the government's policy is to provide schooling for groups of people where it is needed, right? So if there, if there was an Indian community, it was the government's responsibility, the government would accept it as its responsibility to provide schooling for those children of that community. Uh, if, as, in, as it happens in a few cases, there are one or two families living in a, in a, in a small village, uh, you know, one or two Indian families living in a village amongst a, a group of whites, which often happens, it is evident that the government is not going to set up a school for those, for those two or three children. And uh, in, 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 in cases where it is meritorious, and where, you know, they, there is no other way out. Of course, they, they, they get permission to attend white schools or to attend the school of the neighborhood, whatever it might be. Uh, but, but the principle remains that, 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 that for cultural reasons, for language reasons, as we've spoken uh, over before, uh, each one should have the right to send his children to a school which is, where it is, you know, where education is, is, is given according to his own principles and his own cultural background. Which probably makes people prefer to live in the areas of their ethnic background. Makes it much more difficult true. to educate children. But then it does create segregation. That, that is true. I don't think that we have taken as ideal to integrate people willy-nilly. I think uh, the attitude of the government at this point is to leave people as much freedom as possible, talk to as many people, as, as many leaders of all communities as possible, and see how things are going to you know, work out, see what the people actually want and what the people actually need. Well, because, you know, uh, if I may just make one point, this whole, this whole hype about apartheid. It's a system that is 300 years old. It is a system that came into being spontaneously in South Africa when different groups of people got into contact with one another at a certain point in history. And that situation has never remained static. It has evolved continuously. Long before the present uh, policy of reform was announced, very major reforms uh, were carried out. Uh, for example, sport, practicing of sport, which was never uh, allowed across racial barriers in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, was encouraged from 1972 onwards almost. Uh, the whole question of black trade unionism, which was also always seen as something apart from white trade unionism, was reviewed in the middle of the 1970s and from 1979 onwards. All trade unions have complete liberty to organize themselves as they want to. Now, it has happened that some have chosen to remain white, some have chosen to become, you know, to set themselves up as purely black uh, trade unions, which pursue black power ideals and goals and they're free to do so. The vast majority have chosen to become multiracial organizations. Now, if that is any indication of how people in South Africa feel and how they intend and out of their own free will want to cooperate with one another and want to live and work together, uh, then, I, then I think you know, we, we are really spontaneously moving in the direction which will satisfy the most of the people the most of the time. Well, do most people of the tribes who are in their homelands want to be a part of those homelands and want to be involved in government in there? 
or do some of them, with or without agitation from the ANC, are they pressing for representation of the white government in Johannesburg? I think, uh, I think it has become clear uh, politically inside South Africa that uh, through, through all sorts of, uh, you know, the dynamics of society is such that blacks have become a major economic force in, in, in South Africa, not only as laborers, but as entrepreneurs, as managers, as teachers, as professionals in various fields. Uh, in the last, let us say, since 1960, that, that has really started. Uh, it has created a black middle class. It has created new aspirations. It has created new opportunities. But it has also uh, pointed out, you know, to, to, to everyone that blacks shouldn't be seen anymore in their tribal context. There are still a large group of black people who are poorly educated and who live in a tribal fashion in rural areas. Their requirements of, of political representation are quite different from a larger group of sophisticated, well-educated black people living in the great cities. And I think that is a dichotomy that one has to take into account. Uh, in what, is, what, what in the old days used to be termed white South Africa, these black people are living there permanently. It is their home. When, you know, we don't talk of white South Africa anymore. South Africa is for all its people. But those people would, would, would have to have uh, equal representation, and the government has committed itself to equal universal adult suffrage. Well, take uh, a, a professional black in Johannesburg. Can he run for office in the white government? No, he cannot. And that is the major political debate going on in South Africa at the moment. Uh, you, you may be aware that, that the state president appointed a, a man in his office just after the recent elections, beginning of May, Dr. Van der Merwe, uh, to go out and to make a special effort of meeting black leaders of all groups and of, of you know, throughout the country or in, in all the centers to start formal talks about this sort of thing going. The government has committed itself to negotiate with everyone concerned uh, a new constitution, a constitution that would allow equality of political rights, equality of opportunity, that would prevent a situation where one a uh, group of people would feel themselves discriminated against uh, and uh, but that is only that is only you know uh, future inten uh, intention for the future it is something that is only starting to get off the ground now and it is something which is unfortunately once again hampered by the pressure that we are under internationally because while we as a as a as a group of south africans uh, would normally be able to, with friction and with tension and with clashes here and there maybe, work out something amongst ourselves, we find that now as soon as we've achieved a little bit of progress, the pressure is mounting and it creates polarized opinions, it creates more tension in South Africa instead of less. Uh, not only, as I said previously, between whites and blacks, also between entrepreneurs and workers, also between, you know, parents and children, in all sorts of ways. Uh, the economic difficulties uh, that, 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 that are being caused by disinvestment, uh, the pressure to perform, you know, according to norms set up in foreign capitals, uh, does, does create tensions and does create pressure which tend to polarize rather than to bring, bring people together and, and encourage them to work out their own problems and to, and to reach some sort of agreement. It's a very complicating factor to have uh, a communist revolution trying to take place and to agitate 
in the unions, in the homelands. And if you have uh, radical blacks necklacing moderate blacks who are representing them in the governments of the homelands, then you can see this problem coming again with a moderate black in Johannesburg running for office in a white government getting elected and then once more having the attack of the radical blacks. It seems that these problems do need to be solved one at a time and that you are not free to open wide the gates uh, of government simply because you know you have communists pushing, pushing, pushing to get in well, to those it's, seats. It is the government's responsibility to, to protect its people. It is the government's responsibility to maintain uh, law and order, as the jargon expression goes in South Africa. Uh, the government cannot abdicate that, that, that responsibility, it is clear. So they have to uh, do what they can to restrain necklacing, to restrain people you know, attacking one another, burning down other people's houses, burning down public property, schools, offices, etc. Uh, that, is, that is one aspect of the problem. The other aspect is that because this has been happening, as you pointed out rightly, uh, people are f f moderate black people who want to run for office, who want to make their voice heard, are scared uh, to, to become the victim themselves of such sort of attack. And not only the man who might dis wish to run, his children might become the target of necklacing. His children might be attacked at school or wherever they are. You know, it, 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 does, it does cause a man to think twice about his political aspirations, how noble, however noble they may be. Uh, so I think, I think it is clear that the government has to try and calm down the situation try and remove that intimidating factor out of society so that people can with more uh, spontaneity participate in the political process oh. which, they, which they haven't been doing these last two years. What about the plan of Chief Budalese in power sharing? What do you think about his proposals for this representative government? His proposals, well I, I presume you'd refer to, to the uh, Indaba Kwa Natal in Daba, it is called, uh, a group of people who, which came together in Durban, uh, a group that, that, that has been speaking to one another on and off for about 18 months and has finally published a report. It's very interesting. I think uh, everyone is very much encouraged by the fact that such a diverse group of people can come together, sit down, and thrash out something which is acceptable to all of them. Uh, on the other hand, one has to bear in mind that uh, the, the, the people who, who participated in that exercise were not uh, constitutionally or, or let's say by election or by referendum given the, uh, a mandate by the people of Natal to negotiate something like that. And there are groups of people who, f who feel left out, who feel they haven't been represented by any one of those who had been there. So the government regards that report as a very interesting exercise that is going to be studied in great depth, that is already being studied, but that as such it cannot serve as a blueprint. It has to be subjected you know, to scrutiny by the people and the will of the people will have to prevail in the end. Uh, I may just in passing mention that the, that, that, that the Indians feel that, especially, that they've been left out. You know, they, there has been great tension between Zulu and Indian in Natal. And uh, they feel they've been given a raw deal. Uh, that's their right to feel that way, and it's their right to express their opinion. And it has to be also, you know, taken into account by the government. So we can't rush ahead and say, say this is a breakthrough. Let's implement it immediately. Uh, one, has to, one has to be a little bit careful not to antagonize other people, you know, to, to work out something in the proper way. But, but certainly it, it, is, it has served as great encouragement to all of us. Uh, the two centuries of America's history have shown uh, at some time along the way, uh, at various times, various 
ethnic groups have been uh, bottom on the ladder. We had the persecution of Catholics or Italians or the Irish and uh, by and by each one has earned his position and uh, I'm certain that it can be done because it's been done here. It's a, it's a tragic thing to consider that in America where we share a, a similar history uh, there is not a greater understanding and I think Americans perceptions have been shaped by the media and in the United States it's been Bishop Desmond Tutu who continually shows up on the TV screen rather than uh, Chief Budalese who is a, a marvelous figure I think Americans would like to hear from but because of our perceptions I'd like you to look at the following uh, news clip and comment on it if you would relations between the South African government and the media especially the foreign media have never been cozy to give me some else eh? I was ordered by high command. Command, to tell me to leave your peace. Thank you very much. I want your names. The white minority government of South Africa today said, in effect, to hell with what the rest of the world thinks. You don't South Africa's white minority government today declared a sweeping state of emergency that gives police unlimited powers. The government. It is fairly clear what the government is worried about. Next Monday is the 10th anniversary of a black uprising in the giant black township of Soweto outside Johannesburg. The government blames the media for many of its problems. It complains especially about foreign television coverage of sustained racial violence between 1984 and 86. Negative and biased reporting on TV and in newspapers, the government said, led to economic sanctions against South Africa and further fanned the flames of violence. Who would like to comment first? There are various aspects that one might, uh, might bring out. I think uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the first, the first footage, bit of footage showed how the police manhandled a group of journalists. Is that what you really had in mind? Uh, we, we had evidence, uh, well at least it, it was remarked, let's say, during the, the uh, unrest, several incidents of unrest in Johannesburg in the last 18 months, uh, that curiously some journalists were always aware of what was going to happen in advance, uh, you know, of when a spontaneous action is going to take place, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, that, that's, the one, that's the one aspect of it, that clearly there was some uh, orchestration of, of uh, mounting spontaneous attacks on buses or on police vehicles or on, on schools uh, with the media in order to, to create publicity. How about staged events? Right. That is, that is, another, that is another thing that happened that, that, that we have evidence of. That in fact uh, journalists got black children, paid them even, uh, to throw a few Molotov cocktails or to throw a few stones through, you know, through windows in order to have footage, in order to be able to compete on the nightly news in the US with their rival chain, uh, you know, network that, 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 that was lucky enough to, to, to film an authentic event earlier in the day and which they hadn't got. You know, that sort of thing, it, it, it did happen. And uh, I don't want to indict the media for being, you know, consistently dishonest, but there were incidents like that. Well, Americans have gotten the idea from the media that South Africa is a police state. And, uh, of course, we know what happened to Vietnam with media management. Uh, we're acutely aware of that in the United States. But uh, people talk about the police killing young children, four-year-olds in the Soweto riots of 1976, uh, 12 year olds uh, in, in the, the 10 victims of other riots. Uh, and why were 35% of those killed in Soweto riots teenagers? What is the problem of, uh, of communism, children, and uh, this rioting? That's a good question. Uh, it, is, it is, to us, it is obvious that the tactics they're using is to, uh, you, you might also have cited the number of women 
that got into the firing line. That, that women in the Sharpeville uprising of 1960 and later on in, in the 70s, children were pushed into the front line uh, as a matter of tactics, as a matter of arousing you know, sympathy for, for the brutal police force that uh, you know, has to... Who pushed them? Well, you know, there, there, there are various groups of instigators. We believe mainly uh, agents of the ANC, but there are also other groups. PAC is also involved. There, there, there are various groups that, that are active, that are activistic, and that, that, that seek to militarily, or militarily, by force, impose themselves. Uh, and I think uh, in radical uh, political activism, that is one of the things that is being done uh, to, you know, to push children to the front line in order to arouse sympathy. On the other hand, it, it is true that in cities like Soweto, where mother and father often have to work both, and where children are left, you know, to their own devices largely, because we only have a half day school. Our school day normally starts at 7.30 and finishes at about 2 or 2.30 or in the afternoon. Uh, for the rest of the afternoon, until mummy and daddy come home, the children are, you know, are, are on their own, basically. And uh, a rift has, you know, generation gap, communication gap between parents and children, I think is evident in, in many of our great cities, also in Soweto. And uh, children have become, through an active campaign of uh, politicizing them, as, as the term goes, children have become active in politics from the age of 10 or 11, have become interested in why, you know, the injustices uh, were tolerated by their parents and came, you know, uh, confronted their parents became uh, sort of the accusers of their parents saying it's, that it's your fault that we are today in this despicable position. And they are rebelling not only against the government, not only against the system, also against their parents whom they perceive to be part of the system because they do regular jobs, because they have to earn money within, you know, an established economic system. Uh, and, and these children can, of course, very, very easily be lured by promises of, you know, uh, wealth, high positions, I mean, whatever you want to promise them. Uh, in the new South Africa, once they've gotten rid of, of, you know, of the present system. So I think they are a very, a group that is very easily manipulated, a group that has all the, uh, you know, uh, possibilities of being, of being manipulated into that, that, that situation. So it's a division between parents and children that you're seeing? Right. Uh, rebelling against all forms of, of authority. Also, also school authority. How many schools have been burned down? Uh, Is this in the black communities? Right. By, by black blacks? children. Black children burning down their own schools where they go to school every day. Not a majority of them, you know. Uh, this is something I have to stress. If, if you think of Soweto as a city of two million people, where at no point, not even in the worst days of unrest, were there more than maybe two to three thousand people involved in staging all the various incidents that took place. It's a really small group of people. Many children have gone, in those days, have gone back to the homelands to study at homeland schools in the relative security where grandparents could look after them or, you know, other family members or even friends. Uh, so it's, it's not a question of all students, you know, systematically rebelling and, and uh, going on the rampage, it is a very carefully worked out plan. And, uh, and 
these people without any uh, you know conscience at all use children for their own political ends it is it is that's our you know that's my standpoint and you have political funerals too as a result of that that where they become more of a staging ground for more unrest right political what political funerals for you have the martyrs and then as a result of that you have a tremendous a surge of sympathy and you have large crowds of people and again sometimes they get out of hand hmm. if you have a an active communist movement moving behind the scenes and encouraging and agitating riots, necklacing, and doing the kinds of things they do, then you understand why these things take place. And then when you have a few martyrs, then you build on that. And Desmond Tutu will show up, or you'll see a hammered sickle flag in the background, or Alan Bosek will show up, and again you fan the flames of hatred mm -hmm. between groups of people. And again, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And a lot of this is found by the international media. I think that... You know, there's no nation in the world where you cannot find poor. That's right. And where you cannot focus on that if you want to and start the stirring going. Absolutely. But I'd like to know, Reverend Frazier, if you were in Soweto and what was your experience there on your trip? No, I did not get to Soweto. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the night before we were scheduled to go, uh, our tour, uh, the person was going to guide us, was killed in an, uh, in an accident. Uh, he um, was hit by a car or something like that on a motorcycle. And there was unrest the following day in Soweto, and we were not able to go. I, we did, however, go into the uh, Alexandria Township, where we had a chance to talk with, I think, about eight um, teenage members of the ANC. What did they have to say? They, uh, I asked them very directly if they had been involved in the necklacing, and they just looked down at their feet. Um, they did not say, but um, there were two gentlemen present who were obviously very well uh, steeped in the Marxist-Leninist uh, philosophy, who did most of the talking. These are young people who seemed to me uh, very idealistic, uh, uh, very easy to uh, persuade. They are looking for uh, some way to understand uh, their situation. They were concerned about their parents. Uh, they said that their grandparents, their parents and grandparents had been in this, this community for a very long time and that they wanted to see them, as you're saying, emancipated. They, they felt like their parents were um, uh, in their way they had accepted their plight in life, so to speak, were not ambitious enough. And so there was uh, some word about this tension between uh, children and, and parents. They did not say they were revolutionaries, although uh, it was very clear that they were ready to do whatever they thought necessary to resolve the problem as they see it. I was impressed that um, there was a closeness between them. Uh, I don't know, you might say if they had something to fear, I think it's a white government, they, they, they think they have reason to fear it uh, in that township and so they're huddled together. It's very clear that they are not on their own. They were not doing, they were not participating in something simply because they wanted to participate in it. They were not able to articulate the Marxist-Leninist doctrine, for example. It had to be done for them. Um, it's obvious that they were in alignment. There were certain things they're supposed to do and to think. If they think otherwise, they are then in opposition to the party, which means then that their life is in jeopardy or the life of their family members. Now, I think that's true, uh, not only with those youngsters, but uh, in the broader community. People told me in the stores, for example, that they would like to take an active position against the ANC. But if they speak out, they know what the consequences are. One woman told me, when I get back home, I know that my house will be burned down or that my son will be missing. And so I don't believe that we're talking here about a group of black people 
who are taking an, a, a violent approach, a revolutionary approach in South Africa because they want to. I think many who do it are, are, do it because they are fearful of what may happen if they do not. Right, and the, and the rest sit still. The rest are, are, are too scared to oppose the, uh, those revolutionaries. But now that's changing, isn't it? That's changing. I read yes. something in, in the, uh, the Washington Times, I think two weeks ago, about a, quote, vigilante group of blacks that were beginning to respond to the necklacing and to the burning of their homes, etc. And of course, the ANC right away put out the propaganda that these people were being uh, employed by the uh, South African government. Mm -hmm. You know, the interesting thing about the piece that we were allowed to view, uh, the news, as I looked at that piece of news footage, it reminded me of 1965. And if I didn't know better, I would have thought that South Africa was the 51st state. Um, but what was most interesting were the parallels. What we saw was a German Shepherd dog being, being uh, released on black people. What we saw uh, uh, was uh, a white speaking a foreign language, which could have been German. So we got the impression that perhaps this was the Gestapo. Uh, what we saw um, were um, people being attacked uh, and homes and property being destroyed, which, by the way, happened in America, in black inner cities, where blacks burned uh, and destroyed property in the inner city, but it did not belong to them. It belonged to other people who they felt were, in fact, uh, using them uh, for economic gain and profit. My point is here that what you saw there is what you saw in 1965. And the reason that you saw that was so that you could perceive that the same agenda is going on in South Africa that went on in the United States. And that the same solution applies there that we thought applied here. Or the same solution we applied here should therefore be applied there. And I'm not sure I buy that. You consider this managed or censored news that we saw? I can only say that what I saw there, and I want to be very clear, what I saw on the screen was no different with exception of the language spoken by the policeman. It was the same photograph that I saw with Martin Luther King in 1965. They were in a different time and in a different place, but they carried the same message. And I'm saying to you that that message is not necessarily applicable in South Africa. And I'm trying and I want to convey to you that there are differences. There are differences between blacks and there are differences between whites. There are different political systems and clearly that country is not the 51st state of the United States, and therefore our constitutional rights do not apply there. Our, hum our, our Bill of Rights are not applicable to the South Africans. <laughs> Perceptions are, are, are very important in the battle for South Africa. And if we don't understand the information or disinformation and try to rationalize or appreciate what is occurring, then we will continue to support the rest of the world in its move towards more sanctions imposed on South Africa. The consequences of more sanctions being imposed based on perceptions 
that we gain from the media can only serve to wreck the, ec the economy of that country. If we wreck the economy of that country, what are the consequences? Well, we have seen uh, the starving black babies on television from Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Angola. And I don't appreciate seeing black children with large, empty bellies on television. I mean, I don't know who appreciates that, but I sure don't. Um, what are the other consequences? No investment capital, no jobs. No place to sell the products, no markets. No markets, no reason for political dispensation. No political dispensations, no negotiations, no compromise, which leaves us to one or leads us down one logical path. And that path is devastation and destruction. Now, I'm not trying to frighten anybody, but if you, if you want to follow that scenario, that's basically where it takes you. Um, but I think that was an important piece of information or disinformation there. But for those who are unaware, I clearly thought that I was back in 1965. I'm very glad you pointed that out. And since you brought up sanctions, I do have a news clip on sanctions and what was the result of Congress overriding President Reagan's veto in 1986, imposing sanctions on South Africa six months later. Well, while we're queuing it up, I'd like you to tell me what your experience has been, any of you, on new censorship in South Africa, which uh, the government is being accused of by our media. Well, I think that the uh, state of emergency has uh, forced the media to take a serious look at the information that is, that is issued to the world in terms of its reality. I think it has removed, uh, as Ace said, the opportunity for managed reports. And while uh, the footnote and tag at the bottom of written articles state that it is under the guidelines of, of uh, the uh, state of emergency or whatever the tag is, uh, there seems to be more balance in the reporting. Uh, uh, and Clearly, there has been considerable more balance in the reporting since the uh, reporter from the New York Times was, was asked to leave the country. Um, so I think that it has had some positive sides. Uh, and of course, I'm certain that, that the media would say that, that, that it does not offer a free press and, and the opportunity to report the news as it sees the news. But I'm not a journalist, and, and I would prefer that, that the news be honest in terms of what people are trying to do as opposed to what the journalist sees as, as what they're doing from his perception. Well, and Months after the U.S. Congress imposed trade sanctions against South Africa, they have cost the Cape fruit industry alone an estimated $25 million. The result, thousands of people, most of them black, have lost their jobs, 150 in this packing shed alone. But severe as it sounds, the loss is only expected to make, at most, a 15% dent in the industry, manageable as long as other countries continue to import South African fruit. Long term, we feel that it won't be a problem because we will, you know, we will survive. And survival is the first law of business. Sanctions and disinvestment have resulted not in reform, but in a wave of contempt for the United States here. With South Africa's whites-only election May 6th, anti-Americanism has become a campaign issue. We are not a colony of America in any way. 
a recurring sore point during a nationwide radio call-in show, the fact that U.S. sanctions have been limited to industries that don't hurt American interests. So I feel they are being hypocritical. In, in what way? Now, when it suits them in their national interest, they go and exempt these list of minerals. The exemption of strategic minerals and coal has led to bold pronouncements that sanctions are toothless. If, for example, the US, the EC, Japan and, and South Africa's other major trading partners were to apply uniform sanctions, uh, then I think that would be a lot more hurtful. The new South African and Delta Motor Corporation changing for the better. Yeah, we've all got to change for the better. Pullouts by U.S. companies in most cases have been little more than name changes. By selling out to white South Africans, American companies can still market their products here, but they lose any power they may have had to influence change. It is a pity because in this way the United States is actually becoming more and more irrelevant in the whole of Southern Africa. Sanctions and disinvestment may succeed as a moral statement against apartheid and may be fueling the pre-election debate over the pace of reform in South Africa. But as momentum builds in the United States for imposition of a second round of sanctions, pro-sanction strategists will have to contend with what went wrong in round one. We have strategic minerals and strategic sea lanes. Uh, somehow uh, the sanctions didn't apply in those areas and as we see in this reporting an awful lot of people lost jobs in other areas. Uh, what kind of a game is the United States playing, Reverend Vossler? This, uh, this is a very interesting area. The international media really orchestrated this whole business of sanctions in the very beginning and um, the people who pushed it, the celebrity type individuals such as Desmond Tutu and Alan Bosek they have now come around to the point where they begin to see that this shoe is beginning to pinch that foot pretty good. And when black workers lose their jobs, they get unhappy with the people who let them down the primrose path. As a result, um, Tutu has ameliorated his point of view on sanctions, as has Alan Bosek. And the Roman Catholic Church, under Dennis Hurley, who was very uh, adamant in favor of sanctions in the very beginning, set up a special committee to study the whole business and they are now in the process of distance, distancing themselves from their original position because they recognize that this is going to be political, politically unfeasible in terms of maintaining it. Now in terms of sanctions, we, we know that some 60 companies, large corporations of America have pulled out. And we know that many universities and many political entities, governments, city governments, have disinvested and we know that there has been divestment. There's been people who have gotten rid of their stocks and their bonds and so on. So we're dealing with a situation now where sanctions are boomeranging. If the South African government decided to really play political hardball with the West, they could put up counter sanctions in, term of, in terms of manganese, in terms of chrome, in terms of platinum and vanadium, all of these things of which, for the most part, are necessary to manufacture steel. And the European economy, Japan, to a great extent, are dependent. Most people don't realize that 60% of the oil that gets to Europe goes around the Cape of Good Hope, which brings you to the point of choke points. Militarily and geographically and geopolitically, South Africa is a very strategic country in its location. And there are those major choke points where the Soviets are moving their presence more and more. Particularly, there's great concern now about Soviet activity in the Azores. And so we become aware of the fact that South Africa hasn't even begun to play their trump cards. I think one of the things we need to know about South Africa, they're under such a heavy psychological attack in terms of guilt and feelings of guilt. And the Soviets and the United States have ganged up on this country, which to me is an amazing, incredible thing that the South African who have been the staunchest ally in terms of anti-communists, they've been our friends in the West, they've been our strong supporters, that we to declare total economic warfare on South Africa. At the same time, Reagan and Schultz step up trade and aid to the Soviet Union, Red China, and the Soviet bloc countries. It doesn't make sense on one level. It just doesn't make sense unless you understand that Western capitalists and individuals in high positions in multinational corporations in the government 
are totally in alignment with the idea of doing business with Marxist states. If this is only logical conclusion, which leads me right up to the point that I think that your thesis, which you promulgated, of the international capitalist communist conspiracy is the only thing that makes sense in terms of the South African equation. There's nothing else that makes sense to what's going on in South Africa. Apartheid is just simply like the red herring that's being used, tossed out on the table, get everyone fighting, pitting group against group, class against class, race against race, and you have the driving wedge behind that, a communist revolutionary movement with the front group of the African National Congress. So you begin to aware that how many times do we have to be taken down this road exactly. by liberals and left-wingers in the Congress of the United States, Department of States, and the Mueller Nationals, how many times do we have to go down this road before we finally wise up to what's going nation on? Nation by nation, we are losing the base of freedom, That's whether right. it's Afghanistan or Vietnam, or whether it's in totally. Laos, wherever in the world where this moves, it is always the combination. The communists could not move in without the capital support. And you know, the steps are always so clear. They, I think the Shah in his book, uh, I think you've indicated this one of your uh, remarks I heard, the steps of revolution are being followed to a T in South Africa. The international movement, the propaganda movement, the involving of children in it, political funerals, the lining up in terms of sanctions or mobilizing the whole international community against the target of the state. And then finally we get to the point where uh, the United States Department of State says we can no longer back this government like they did with the uh, Somoza. And then you back the new African National Congress. We're trying to make these people, what are we doing? We're trying to sanitize the African National Congress now. And I don't know how you can sanitize a group of terrorists, murderers, and thugs that are backed by the Soviet Union. There's no way you can do it. Is it your proposition that South Africa will never be able to satisfy the Western agenda? The Western agenda in terms of multinationals and international corporations, I hope they never do. Okay. Because if they do, it's gone. Because the multinationals and the international bankers They've already got their deals going with the Soviet Union. They know exactly what they're doing. And it's quite obvious, the steps, of course, the last step of, after you get to that point where the United States State Department says, you're no longer a viable state, like they did, in, for example, in Rhodesia, then you reach the point of declaring this new national democratic government, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, Mugabe over here in Zimbabwe, and then you give them the sanction, you give them the blessing, the Pax Bobiscum peace over them. <laughs> and then after that's done for one year, after they milk the West of the resources they can get out of them, as much money as they can get out of the State Department, or out of our, I can't remember, I think it was 118 million we gave to Nicaragua and to Daniel Ortega and his boys when they went in. Well, after that's done, after about a year, then suddenly we discover amazingly that these people that we backed and supported were actually Marxist Leninists. And Fidel Castro wasn't the George Washington of Cuba, as written in the New York Times, but was actually a communist dictator. So when you get right down to it, geopolitically, the West is in a struggle for survival with a very militant, aggressive, communist, expansionist state that knows what the score is. And our multinationals and our international bankers they get open access, the red carpet is rolled out whenever they roll in. When David Rockefeller visits overseas, the red carpet treatment goes out. And of course, Tony Sutton did a great job of explaining how this, this works. So when you figure it out, you understand that the basic struggle, and this is where we disagree on what we discussed a little earlier, is ideological in terms of the subject of freedom versus non-freedom. And who are the friends of freedom, and who are the friends of the totalitarian state? Who are the friends of the communist model, who are the friends of the free enterprise Western model. And I think really, unless American people wake up to the fact of what's going on, as you said, they take a chunk here, a chunk there, we're running out of chunks. Because the communist world is a parasitic movement. It feeds on its conquest. And of course, in the West, we're quite willing to give them. 
Afghanistan, the Department of State says, well, that's in the Soviet sphere of influence. How long did they back, you know, actually block Stinger missiles? You know, they have fought everything in, in terms of even humanitarian aid. So when you get right down to it, we're in a life and death struggle. South Africa is just one piece of the geopolitical puzzle, just one part of it. But again, we see very clearly how the Soviets move, how a, a revolutionary movement takes over in a so-called war of liberation. Liberation for what? Liber liberation for a new set of tyrannical leaders, finding out that what comes in is usually far worse than what went out. But the, Amer the American government and the American media are not leveling with the American people. So the American people do not understand that they are not on the right side of the issues. I mean, we have 40,000 Americans uh, picking coffee beans in Nicaragua for the Sandinistas, not helping the freedom fighters, because this is what they've been told. So you come back to South Africa, and you are being intimidated so heavily by world condemnation. What we want to say to you here is that it's important that you realize that you must be true to the real self and the reality of every citizen of South Africa and not respond to either of the superpowers. This is the strong support we want to give you here at this meeting. It's our desire to send this to the South African government, uh, to the chiefs of the tribes, uh, to the Indians, uh, to the whites, that we do understand and a large segment of America does understand. And we do not want to see South Africa go down because South Africa is a nation of all nations that have had this two-pronged attack move in that can survive it if they will maintain the will and, and if you will continue to believe in yourselves and in what you're doing, we know that you are moving uh, away from apartheid. We know that the Bolsheviks came in when the Tsar had already had many reforms, when there was industry, creativity, productivity in Mother Russia. We know that a few, in fact, we were told here at this forum, 200 Sandinistas literally took over Managua and the government of Nicaragua. And this is why we are so concerned, because the people are not awake, and the society where it happens uh, does get intimidated. The black moderates are intimidated. What I'd like to do is to send a message uh, to Winnie Mandela. Why are you saying that revolution is the only way? Why are you murdering your own people? Why are you advocating this necklacing? How can you enter into the brutality of a satanic right of burning people alive. This is so outrageous. Why don't you open your eyes and see how your blacks are suffering under this communist revolution and how through what you're advocating they are, using, they are losing their jobs. We, we have a clip on this very, very subject uh, which does show uh, one such burning. I'd like to show it at this time, if you could cue that up. And I'd like you to respond and tell me what your perception is of what our uh, view is of our description of what's happening in South Africa, each of you. Well, it certainly is, is remarkable, uh, as I think I've, I, I, I must have said, that the pressure is is not coming from you know we're not we're not experiencing two forces pressuring us in two different directions what we experience is that as soon as as soon as one problem has been identified certain 
solutions are prescribed to us, uh, which we mainly are not happy with. After, you know, after a number of years, we, we work out a compromise that we are happy with and that really objectively should satisfy the Western norms that have been set. Uh, we can we can take the uh, the Olympic Games as an example. We were set out of the Olympic Games uh, on the pre on you know on the grounds that that, that uh, sport was a part, uh, was practiced under the how shall I put it in an apartheid context that people didn't have equal opportunities of, of competing against one another inside South Africa, therefore South Africans shouldn't have the right to compete internationally. Right. The solution was suggested to us. Uh, today, we have fully integrated sport in South Africa. No one is prepared to rescind that decision. The British, uh, within the Commonwealth system, uh, the Glen Eagles Agreement was signed, also to isolate us on, uh, on, on, on uh, you know, in sport, in international sport. Uh, and at the time, we were told that as soon as you uh, select multiracial teams, as soon as your repre uh, sport representatives abroad are selected on merit, and you know, we can see that race plays no role in it we shall compete against you again in various disciplines of sport. No one has been prepared to do that, although you know, equality in sport has been accomplished for at least 10 years now. Uh, so the pressure is mounting. Each time we achieve something, you know, something more is demanded of us before there could be any sort of normalization in relations with the West. And that is bothering us. And we are made to feel outcast, out, you know, out of Western society. To the point, actually, that our foreign minister, a number of years ago already, uh, stated that the West should not, should not really count on South Africa in, ter in, in time of, of emergency, uh, you know, to to, to support it because we haven't, we haven't received the slightest bit of support uh, in the face of what is evidently, uh, you know, communist attempts at, at uh, fomenting revolution in South Africa. So I don't want to go as far as to say that it's the same, you know, it's the same force that is working against us. But certainly there are two forces that are working in pretty much the same direction. Mr. Ken, Mr. Kendricks, what, do you, what is your view of the, what he's saying about the sports situation? Do you agree with his comments? Well, clearly the, uh, uh, he's correct. <laughs> it's simply put, but I mean, uh, They have integrated sport in South Africa. As a matter of fact, uh, sport in South Africa is probably more integrated than sport in the United States. Um, and I say that uh, just on the heels of uh, the whole Al Campanis issue, uh, where people recognize that there are no black-owned or Mexican-American owned, or Greek owned, <laughs> basketball, professional basketball teams. Uh, I don't know about Greek owned football teams, but I know there are no <laughs> black owned football teams. Um, uh, very few professional black pro golfers or tennis pros on the circuit. And yet, the same rules don't apply to us that apply to the South Africans. Well, let's get South Africa to the Olympics. That'd be great. Let's back that. Come back.
We'll look at this clip now. Uh, the other picture here is Maki Skoskona. She was a black girl who attended a large funeral rally. She was accused of being a government informer, thrown to the ground. She was stoned. She was burned to death. A few feet away, a Dutch news team captured uh, this on film. Horrible pictures. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.